I want to remind everybody I'm going to take communion at the end of this service because I mentioned it earlier whenever we, we were getting ready to get started. We have this. If you have some kind of crackers or some kind of juice of any sort, it really doesn't, like I said earlier, it doesn't have to be all professional. Amen. It's, it's the point of the matter of what, we're, of what we're doing here. We're remembering Jesus. You know, a lot of the songs that they sang just now focused on the love of God, focused on the love of Jesus. And while they were singing, I remembered a song that I used to really like. It had a little bit of a bluesy feel to it. It was sung by Lindell Cooley. And, it, and he said, I was there when your love came down. And you know, there, there's a dual meaning to that song, right? Because that God's love came down in Jesus Christ, amen? But at the same time, he was singing in the song saying, I was there when your love came down. In other words, it wasn't just that God's love manifested itself or came down from heaven on the earth in a real sense, but also in a real sense for us as individuals. And he was saying, personally, I was there when your love came down. I experienced that moment in my life whenever your love touched me. I don't know if you can say that. I hope you can. But I got to tell you that when his love comes down and it takes residence on the inside of your heart, it, it, you know it. Amen. And, and, and listen, then you can sing of his love. Amen. And then you can sing of his love forever because I know that there was a long time in my walk, in my early Christian journey, where there were things in my life that I was not pleased with and I wanted to be free. I can remember I would cry out to the Lord so many times and I would say, Lord, I know that my heart's not right with you. I know that I'm not in a place where I need to be. Um, and Lord, won't you do the work in me? And then, you know what? It came. It came through through circumstance and, and, and tragedy and frustration. It came one night whenever I was wandering helpless and, and I could not help myself. And the Lord showed up. The Lord showed I was there that night when, when his love came down. And, and it transformed everything. And it was so obvious that it was a miracle from God because, see, everything that I had been trying to do. And I, I look, I'm not trying to blame the preacher. But, but the, the, sadly, the preachers that I had sat under, they preached a the message of the word. It was like, well, you ought not do this and you ought not do that. And listen, in order to not do this or that, then what you need to do is you need to read more. You need to, you need to come to church more. And you've and you, and you, and you got to pray. And you, and you, got, you, you know what? Yeah, Christians do all those things. Amen? The word of God is very clear. Forsake not the gathering of the brethren. The word of God is very clear. Psalm 119, 105, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word is very clear that the word of God is the word of God. Amen. And we'll never know the heart and the mind of God unless we know the word of God. But at the same time, it's not my doing of all these actions that's going to give me the victory in my life. No, it's me understanding what the word is communicating. That his love came down. Amen. I want you to know that this morning. His love came down in the form of Jesus. God the Father loved you and I enough to send us his love. And whenever that becomes personal for your life, hallelujah, you become overwhelmed with the love of God. He brings deliverance, you know. The Lord himself said in Luke chapter 4, For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to tell us the story of victory, to set those that were captive free, those that were blind to give them sight, those that couldn't hear to let them hear, those that were lame and couldn't walk to be able to walk. Listen, sometimes we get so focused in the Pentecostal church, the charismatic church. I want to see the person in the wheelchair get up and walk. I want to see blinded eyes. Praise God for all of that. But what about your spiritually blinded eyes and you can't see the Lord? What about our deaf ears that can't hear the word of the Lord? What about our lame feet that can't help us to walk a straight and narrow path? No, Lord, let us start with this place. Let your love come down. Let it fill our hearts, O oh Lord, and bring us to the place where we can sing of your love forever. I don't know about you, but listen, sometimes I'm going through a rough day, right? And it seems like it's real dark in the night. And, and even sometimes when I'm going through that, I, I, I have this tendency just to forget how close he is. You know what I'm saying? He's just, he's just waiting there. He's just one whisper away. He's just waiting for us to whisper his name. Amen. And when we do that, I'm telling you, he will show up. Praise God. So listen, it's the day after Christmas. I think it's so important that we celebrate the birth of our Savior. 
I titled my message tonight, Oh Holy Night. Originally, I, well, I'm not going to get into all that, but anyway, I titled it Oh Holy Night. Because, and you'll, and you'll see why I believe by the time it's done. Remember, if you're gonna if you're gonna take communion with us at the end to get your crackers and juice together, Amen. But let's go. Let's start reading in Matthew uh, chapter two, and we're gonna read verses one through eleven. So, if you have your Bibles at home, Matthew two verses one through eleven. Before we get started and you're turning there, I just want to say we have we had a few people in the church that were sick, and listen, you know, many of you that actually know me know that I'm also a nurse practitioner. I gotta tell you. The Omicron variant is here. You know, you do what you want with that. But last week I saw maybe four people on a day that had COVID and Christmas Eve. I worked a 12 hour shift. And I mean, there was what I had well over 20 positives and then the other providers had positives too. Anyway, it is what it is. But you know, while we were worshiping, the Lord just put it in my heart. We're not going to shut down the church. Amen. Because, uh, so we want to be wise, right? And we don't want to go around infecting everybody. And, you know, some people would say, well, you know, and listen, I'm just going to say it like it is. Well, if, if everybody had the shot, then you wouldn't, and that's not even true. Because, yeah. listen, many of the people that are positive, as a matter of fact, the majority of the Saints players are probably vaccinated. And guess what? Twelve of them can't play in the game. So it's not true that people that are vaccinated aren't still getting sick and spreading the contagion. No, the reality is, is that what they're saying is, that, as a matter of fact, they'll admit that. And I don't mean to talk about the shot, but I'm trying to make a point. Okay, just bear with me. As a matter of fact, what they're saying is, is that people that have the shot can still get sick and spread the virus. And what they're saying, though, for the individual purpose, if you get the shot, your sickness will likely be less severe. Okay. So, but the point is, is this, is that a person that's, you know, had COVID already has some antibodies. And, uh, and yes, they wax and wane just like the shot waxes and wanes, and that's why they got to get boosted. So what is my main point? I'm not here to preach about the shot. I'm trying to make a point that we're not going to shut down church. Amen. Right? And that, but what I will say is, is this, is that if you have symptoms, if you lose your taste or smell, if you're coughing and you have fever, just do us all a favor and stay home. I mean, if you want to test yourself, well, if you know you were exposed and then you develop symptoms, even if you're tested negative, just wait a few days to where you find out whether or not you have it, right? And that you don't spread it. Do your best to, to be mindful of others. But to be honest with you, moving forward, you know, we're going to do our best to not really, uh, you know, we want to have church. Amen. We want to have church. We're, we live in the midst of perilous times. Amen. All right. So let's read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor. It's another word. It, this is an Old Testament prophecy from the prophet Micah that foretold that the Savior, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. And that word governor is another word to describe a ruler or king. And that he should rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. What time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, the star which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Amen. Isn't that good? Doesn't the, doesn't the word joy just to kind of encourage yeah. you? Know, don't we all want some joy in our lives? But many times we find ourselves and we don't feel very joyous. Is that true? I mean, I think it is. 
right? But it, it did nice whenever you do feel joy. I want to talk to you about joy a little bit later, but let's keep going. And when they were coming to the house, they saw, when they were, when they were coming to the house, sorry, I lost my spot. And when they come to worship it, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Verse 11. There we go. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. Now we're going to go ahead and go to the book of Luke. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 8 through 14. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore or very afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Amen. The word, the word joy again. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Amen. That, that, that means that, that Jesus was sent to all people all over the whole earth. It doesn't matter whether you're from China. It doesn't matter whether you're from Arabia, the Arabian area. It doesn't matter whether you're from Europe. It doesn't matter whether you're from the United States or the, or the North American continent. It does not matter where you come from on this globe. The angels on that night sung a song, hallelujah, and they said, I got good tidings. I got a message of great joy. See, the Lord wants you to know tonight that you have opportunity for great joy in the midst of your life. And it's for all people. Amen. So I'm here to tell you that no, Buddha wasn't sent for all people. I didn't know that I was going to say this, but I'm going to go ahead. Allah was not sent for all people. Okay, Jesus was sent for all people. Hallelujah. He's the Savior of the world. He's the Messiah. He's the one that was anointed by God and foretold of the prophets thousands of years before he ever showed up. And it was foretold that he had a purpose. And the purpose was to make right what the first Adam made wrong. God had created Adam. In his image and likeness. God, God's intent was that the human race would be created in the image and likeness of God. But then Adam, in his sin, took sin into himself. And now, as the fountainhead of all humanity, the, 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 the disease, the, de the infected DNA, if you will, the sinful nature has been spread throughout all of the human race. But good news, good news on that glorious holy night with the stars bright and shining. God gave a gift. I, they were there when his love came down. Amen. I want you to know that tonight, this morning. That they were there when his love came down. The shepherds were there. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. So he said this. They go on to say this. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. That's another word for Bethlehem, by the way. A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. That means a bunch of angels. Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. You know, these two passages reference our Savior's birth. His supernatural birth is paramount. It's so important because, you see, the beginning of the story should draw our mind to the end. And what I mean is, if you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, what I mean is, is that this supernatural birth that was foretold by multiple prophets, yes, he would be born in Bethlehem, but also that he would be born of a virgin, according to the prophet Isaiah. And that, according to the psalmist, that he would be pierced in his hands and his feet. I'm here to tell you, thousands of years before he ever showed up on this night, God had a plan. And God's plan was to redeem the human race. I want you to see this. 
Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. What I need you to understand is this, is that God became man. And then God clothed himself in human flesh, not sinful human flesh. That's what made Jesus different <coughs> than you and I. Jesus was not born of his father Adam like you and I were born. See, we have a connection to Adam. We're his children. Jesus is not a child of Adam. Jesus is the son of the living God. Amen. And, then, and this supernatural plan of God would allow that sinless life of Jesus to be paid as payment for our sin. It's important that we recognize and celebrate Christmas properly. It's a hard thing in the modern society that we live in. But I need you to know that if we're gonna if we're gonna celebrate Christmas properly, we need to kind of like pay attention to what just happened in this passage we read. Heaven stopped Amen. what it was doing. <laughs> I want you to know that. See, because through the years I have experienced and, and, and kind of come into communication with various people, like, oh, you know, whether Jehovah's Witnesses don't don't celebrate Christmas, and then you have people in the church that are like, he wasn't born on December 25th. This is just a remanufacturing of the winter solstice. And, you know, December 25th isn't when he, I don't really care. Okay, I don't, what I know is this, heaven stopped what it was doing on this night, hallelujah, the heavens opened up, an angel appeared to the shepherds in the field, and a heavenly choir began to sing, I got good tidings, peace on earth, good will towards them, for unto you this night, the Savior is born, hallelujah, in this city of David. That which you've been waiting on for these thousands of years as the children of Israel, as the people of God has finally arrived. The prophet foretold in Micah that he would be born in Bethlehem. The prophet foretold in Isaiah that he would be a root or a stem of Jesse, which was David's father. And he was born in the city of David, known as Bethlehem, translated as the house of bread. Bethlehem, the house of bread. It's so important that we celebrate Christmas properly. Heaven stopped and recognized and announced the birth of the Savior of the Word. I mean, the world, the, the good tidings, that word's there. Euangeliozo, it means to announce good news. I mean, these angels were preaching the gospel before they were preachers. Amen. I mean, yeah, the prophets foretold it. But New Testament wise, before the very first New Testament preacher opened his mouth, heaven preached it for him. Amen. Joy was referenced in both passages that we read and describes calm delight. You know, I was thinking the difference between inward peace from God versus external happiness, there's a big difference between that. Peace that is inward from God versus external happiness that is created by temporary things. I'm telling you right now, you, you, if you're searching for happiness, Created by temporary things? Come on, my friend. I know I've been preaching it a lot of different ways for a lot for quite some time. And I know, and I know that sometimes I didn't even believe in myself. But God has a way of convincing us. Amen. This joy that he's talking about. See, I want you to understand something. That whenever Jesus was born, he was born in the midst of the Roman Empire. And Rome had Israel under its foot. And they were in a sense, slaves to Rome. Yes, he allowed them to function day to day, the emperor of Rome did, but they were not truly free. They acted like they were. The religious leaders seemed to forget that they were under the boot of Nero, but yet at the same time, they acted like they were free, but they weren't free. And many times in our lives, we act like we're free, and, and the reality is, is that we're not free, especially whenever we're bound by sin. Come on, Christian. And listen, most of the time we believe that these things are going to provide us happiness. And if we're honest with one another, so many different things cause a little flood of neurotransmitters to, to enter our, the synapses of our brain. What are you trying to say with this physiological science message you're preaching? I'm going to tell you what. Whenever you were a teenager and you got a new girlfriend and you were talking to, we used to have landlines, we didn't have cell phones. You got a new girlfriend and you talked to her on the phone, what happened? You get all excited. Some people say, I get some butterflies in my tummy and my heart starts beating. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to talk to her again. That didn't last very long. 
long. True. <laughs> I'm being honest with each other. I don't last very long. Right? The smell of new leather. Oh, man. It, 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 it wears out. It doesn't last very long. You get the point I'm trying to make, and we can go down the list. We don't need to, we don't need to go through every single thing. I think y'all get the gist of what I'm saying. External happiness that is temporary. And if that's what we're looking for, we're going to go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. I'm here to tell you that on that night, the dear Savior was born, and he's offering inward joy. What I'm talking about is that even though you live under the system of the Roman Empire and you're a slave to Rome, you can still have the joy of God. That's right. Even though you might live in medieval times and they're hiding the word of God, somehow, someway, I guarantee you, even during those times in the dark ages, God allowed somebody to hear the good news of his word and they had joy on the inside of their hearts. Even in the midst of this crazy world that we're living in right now with this pandemic and regional disasters and personal problems that we all experience, you can be there when his love comes down. Amen. You can be there and have the joy of the Lord, the inward peace of God on the inside of your heart. Well, I haven't experienced it, preacher. Well, listen to me. All I know to tell you is, is to keep on moving towards the Lord. What I'm trying to say is, you and I have to determine whether we're going to be servants of the Lord or not. There ain't no more time for mucking around and playing around. we got to ask the question to ourselves. Are we believers just in our head or are we going to be believers in our heart? Because a believer in a heart that's truly saved and has the Holy Spirit in their heart, that Jesus has been birthed in this little manger right here, then guess what happens? The Holy Spirit will begin to lead you and guide you. And when the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding the servant of the Lord, guess what he's doing? He's allowing, he's helping you to realize the decisions that need to be made that are going to move you closer and closer towards God. What are, what are you trying to say, preacher? Churches are filled with people this morning. Churches are filled with people this morning that are not serving God. Listen to me. Just because you show up at church on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night does not mean that you are serving God. Just because sometimes you crack the cover of a Bible every now and then does not mean that you're serving God. Or that you crack the cover of a Bible every single day. It doesn't mean that you're serving God. Serving God means more than just showing up at church and reading the Bible. Serving God means more than just raising one or two hands during a worship service. Serving God matters when you walk outside the doors of this church. I'm not talking about perfect life. There was only one man that was perfect. His name was the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator between man and God. The man Christ Jesus. What I'm trying to talk about is the recognition that I, separate from God, separate from the help of God, I am not going to be able to get it done, my friend. I need help from God, but the question is, do I want to be a servant of God? I have experience all the time with people that are in the world. I work a couple of secular jobs, and I'm so glad that I do. And let me tell you something, not everybody's personality is going to be the same as mine. I get that. But if we're servants of the Lord, we're going to bring Jesus to us. And every decision of our life, in some way, needs to be filtered through the truth of God's word. Because if we're continuing to make decisions that are separate from the word and the will of God, we will continue to go down pathways that move us further from God. And, and cause us to look like the world instead of a servant of the Lord. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Can I just break it down for you? None of this is in my notes. But look, let's just be real. God has always called his people to be separate. Not, not isolated. No. As a matter of fact, churches that try to isolate themselves and try to pretend that they're the only gig in town. Right. Come on, somebody. We know that that's not true. However, we also need to understand that false doctrine matters, right? And we need to live somewhere in the midst of that truth. But isolation is not the same as separation. Separation is describes the fact that God said, you are my people, Israel. I'm just going to give you a little quick history lesson. You are my people, Israel, and you will circumcise the foreskin, which represents the cutting away of flesh 
through the shedding of blood, and you will be my people. I will give you my law, which is my word, and the people around you will know that you are close to your God because there's no other people on earth that have their God so close to them. How are you going to get your God close to you? Because you're going to have to know the word of God. As a matter of fact, I, I asked Danielle to order. We're going we're gonna to order some, some pamphlets that's going to, if you want them, you know, you the I don't think that they're going to be really expensive for the church to buy, but it's going to help you to be able to read through the whole Bible if you just follow this up. I think it's very important that people at some point in time, if they're going to be servants of the Lord, now I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just trying to say, I think if you want to be a servant of the Lord, it will be helpful to you. Let me word it that way. If you have actually read the whole Bible, amen, in some chronological fashion. Because it gives you a picture of the whole, amen, and then you can also go back and understand the smaller parts. But if you don't have a big picture of the whole, it makes it difficult to wrap your mind around what God is really doing in this earth. When you begin to realize what God's purpose is, it kind of causes your, uh, is it okay if I say this, kind of causes your little world to shrink down a little bit. You see, because so many times we're walking around and we're very big in our own mind. And God, guess what? Can I tell you this? You're big in God's mind too. You really are. But at the same time, God has a balance. God has it perfectly balanced and he understands that while you personally are big in his mind, the world also is big in his mind. And God wants to get something done. And if we don't have people that are serving, if we don't have people following after the Lord, living for God, making daily decisions. Listen, you can't just go take a job because somebody's offering you $2 more an hour. The reality of it is, is, is that that may not be where God wants you right now. I don't even know why I'm talking about all this. I guess maybe because I've been talking to other people about it here recently and it's on the forefront of my mind. The servant of the Lord does not always know exactly where God's bringing him a year from now, six months from now. But you know what the servant of the Lord does? He trusts that God will take care Amen. of him. Right. He trusts that God knows better for him What's going to happen in six months, right. one year, five years, ten years? Right. And so, therefore, he doesn't make his own decisions based on what he thinks is best for him right at that moment. But instead, he serves the Lord and he invites God into the decisions that he makes. And you know what he did whenever he did that? Ten, five years down the road, ten years down the road, fifteen. You look backwards and you're like, wow. It didn't turn out the way I thought it would, but I know. That God's hand has been on my life. And the whole time I was going through things that I didn't understand why I was having to go through, he was working on me. He was working on me. He was letting me, the love of God be revealed on the inside of my heart. So I want you to know that that, and, and listen, that'll bring great joy. Let's bring it back to joy. That'll bring great joy when you realize that God has actually been working in your life. Even though, but I've been messing it up. Guess what? We all been messing it up, my friend. If we're honest with one another, listen, if you came with some preacher that you thought was going to, no, 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 you've got the wrong God. We all been messing it up, but God doesn't waste anything. Don't let the person around you out there in the workplace, out there in the community that knows all the dirty secrets of your life hold you down in bondage. That's what the enemy does. He's a condemner and he's a liar from the beginning. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. You're the, your father is the devil and he's a liar. He only speaks one language. I'm here to tell you this morning that when this love comes down, you become a new creation. That's what the Bible says. In the mind of God, when you get born again, you become a new creation. God told the children of Israel back in the book of Isaiah, he said, come. Come and let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be made white as wool. White as wool, white as snow. Your, your sins are very ever in the front of your mind. People around you will, will, will always want to try to hold you down. I've talked to people before after I've been preaching. They said, man, you got a church full of drug addicts and, you, and, you're, and you're a drug addict. Okay? And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I, and you know, I'm just like, well, well I'm not going to tell you what I told him. But, but what I will say is this, is that, see, you don't understand the Bible, my friend. The Bible says that I'm a new creation in Christ. 
That's why it's different than rehab. Come on, somebody. You need to hear that this morning. Christianity, true Christianity, when his love comes down on that on that holy night when the stars are bright and shining, when it comes into your heart, it's different than rehab. It's not a rehabilitation. It's a recreation. The Holy Spirit comes to live in the heart and it begins to transform the inner man. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. Amen? And now you and I need to learn how to believe that. That, no, I am a new creation in Christ. The angels announced the good news that the earth was looking for. Amen? The angels didn't just say it. They sang it. Peace on earth. Good will towards men. And every human heart longs for peace to quiet his disturbed soul. Yet it so often evades us, especially during this time of the year. People seem most sad and unhappy. So often people imagine that God is against them or that he isn't real. Because if he was real, then he's cruel. Because look at this damaged world. No, it's not true, Christian. It's not true. He announces peace on earth and goodwill towards men. He has goodwill towards you. He loves you and he wants to bless your life. Amen? I want you to know, and this is really where I'm shifting gears a little bit. And I want to make you aware of that. I want you to know that God has worked very hard to prepare mankind in advance for the arrival of Jesus. When you begin to read the whole Bible, like I was talking about earlier, you begin to realize. When the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, you begin to realize God has really, can we use human terms for a second? God has really been working hard. <laughs> God has really been working hard. If you think about this plan and the fact that he created a nation out of one man and through that nation he gave us the prophets. And year after year after year, he foretold that Jesus was coming. And all of the people that shed their blood and died for the faith and to continue to speak the truth, even in the midst of that perilous times, God has really been working. He's really been working hard to prepare man in advance for the arrival of Jesus. The king must be born on earth so that he can be born in every heart. And God has been announcing the birth of his king for thousands of years before he was actually born. And for the next few minutes, I want to focus on that. Proof of this is the Matthew version of what we read. The story where we read about the wise men. Translated, magi. Translated from the word magi. Where we get the word magician. Which describes magicians, astrologers, or even sorcerers. That would come from the areas of Babylon and Persia. We three men of Orient are. These magi were magicians, sorcerers, astrologers that came from the east of the area of Babylonia and Persia. Okay? And, and we have previous reference to the magi in another book of the Bible. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 2 verse 2. I believe that this is one of the most... See, for me, i got to ask the question. Okay, so you saw a star in the sky, and you're, con you're from a whole other country. Do you understand that Jesus' birth... See, for you and I, Jesus' birth is very magnified in our mind, right? Because why? Because we grew up in America. We grew up in a place where the gospel has been very uh, prolific, right? Very around us all the time. We have given our heart to the Lord. We've sat in churches. Many of us have sat in churches. And, and we've been celebrating Christmas because it's kind of like an American holiday. So the birth of Jesus is very, is very alive and awake in our hearts and in our minds. But do you understand that when Jesus was born, this was a very, this was a tiny little nation. Jesus was, was a, his family was, was living up in northern Galilee, a very poor little village town. Mary was, nobody knew Mary. Joseph was a carpenter. <laughs> you know, th that's why everybody rejected. I mean, yeah, later, whenever we can start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, we realize, wait, hold on a second, he actually was born in Bethlehem. Wait, hold on a second, he actually comes from the tribe of Judah. Wait, hold on. he was actually connected to King David. Wait, he was pierced with nails? Wait, the prophets wrote about all this. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that when it happened, ain't nobody knew. Any of this? Jesus and Mary showed up in this bustling town in Bethlehem on that night. There was no room for them in the inn. That's why they had to sleep in a manger with dirty animals. Because, why? Because there was a census that Herod had decreed, that Caesar had decreed, that all the inhabitants would be, would be counted so that they would have to pay taxes. They had to go back 
to the land of their fathers, the city of David, this town of Bethlehem, where Joseph's descendants came from because Joseph was from Solomon's line and Solomon was from King David. And so that's the whole point. Listen to me, how beautiful of a story can it get that they're way up in Nazareth and God will fulfill this word and the prophet said he would be born in Bethlehem. Caesar's thinking he's going to do a tax because he wants to put more money in his pocket. But what Caesar doesn't know is the big God of the, of the universe is doing all of that and moving things on the human stage to get his Savior to Bethlehem to be born. I mean, how do you, what I'm trying to say is, is that it was very obscure. Nobody knew about Jesus. Hmm. Nobody knew about Jesus. We know about Jesus because it's 2,000 years later. But at that point in time, nobody knew about it. So the, what, did, what did you say all that for, preacher? I'm going to tell you why. So what's up with this store? Hey, how do these magicians from the East even know that there's a store that's going to represent the king of the Jews? You understand what I'm getting at? I don't know about you, but that, that question begs to be asked by you. I, that maybe, that, maybe that's a, a problem with the way that I think. It's like I can't leave. I'm, by the grace, I don't want to leave a, a stone unturned, but it, 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 it makes me question. How in the world do you even know about this star? And how would you see this star in the sky? Many people believe that it was actually the alignment of two planets. And it caused this huge light in the sky. Okay, that's fine. And you're an astrologer, so you said in stars. Okay, that's fine. But how do you know that this star equals out to a king of the Jews when you live in way over there? And this little thing happened in this little bitty old town called Bethlehem in some nation that you don't even recognize. I don't understand that. Well, I can't prove all this I'm about to tell you. But I'm about to take you on a little journey where I believe why they would have known. And the main point that I'm trying to make is, is this. God has worked very hard to prepare mankind in advance for the arrival of Jesus. For thousands of years before he was ever born, God has been preparing people to know. Why? Because he wants to prove to you and I and to all people that have come before us and all people that will come after us that he has a plan. Hey, hey, I got good tidings for you. Peace on earth. Good will towards men. Joy for your hearts. Amen. Joy for your life. God wants people to know that. God wants people to know that. And whenever you and I will come to know that, I got good news for you. You're going to be there when his love comes. You're going to begin to realize, man, God is working on this big old human stage, this big old world stage. But at the same time, he's very, very concerned about me. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2, verse 2. There we go. The king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to show the king his dream. So they came and they stood before the king. Now, I need you to know Nebuchadnezzar, real quick, had a dream. It's a long story. I'm not going to get into it. But what, what, what he told these, these were the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers in Babylon. This is after King Nebuchadnezzar went and stole Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and brought them back to Babylon. Right? And, 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 and so this is what they have over there. They got sorcerers, magicians, astrologers. This is how they try to figure out what's going to happen in the world. Because they don't know the God that they need. And Nebuchadnezzar said, listen, you're even going to interpret these dreams, this dream that I have. No, you're going to tell me what my dream was and then interpret it or you're going to die. And all of them are going to die. Okay, so. Well, so even though Daniel lives in this province, he's very obscure. Nobody knows who he is. The, the, the leader of the Hebrew boys that was over them knew who he was because you remember Daniel took a stand. He said, no, I'm not going to eat your food and I'm not going to drink your wine. And if you will test the Lord in this, then you're going to see that we're going to look better than those other ones that are doing it the way you want to do it. All right. So he knew about this, Daniel. And so when nobody else can give the answer, they go get Daniel. They could not interpret the dream. In other words, those astrologers and magicians and, and sorcerers couldn't interpret the dream. Guess what? Daniel knew a God that reveals secrets to men. Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. This is what Daniel said. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. Hallelujah. 
I want you to know this morning that there's a God in heaven that reveals secrets and gives wisdom and will give you understanding that you will be able to know and if you're led by his spirit, what's to come. And he wants to reveal the secrets of his love towards you, the secrets of his plan towards you. He wants to reveal it to the world, but he wants to start it with you so that he can use you to reveal it to somebody else on the side of you. This is how God has chosen to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. He, he has chosen to use individuals for thousands of years. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed. Look at Daniel 2.48. So Daniel gives him the interpretation of the dream. It's a long story, but he gives him the interpretation of the dream. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar... It's so exciting. Look what it says right here. I want you to see something. I'm trying to tell you the history of what I believe went down with this thought. I can't prove it completely, but I'm trying to tell you what I believe is the history of this thought. Because, see, for me, the question has to be asked. How do you know about this thought, man? And I'm telling you, I believe the Bible really came. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him great, many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Look at this. And chief of the governors, look at this, over all the wise men of Babylon. Made him ruler over all the wise men of Babylon. Over all the magi. you got to understand something. Daniel interpreted the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he became in charge of all the wise men of that province. And guess what? Even after that, he prophesied that Persia was going to take over. And for Nebuchadnezzar's son, Daniel was alive whenever Persia took over Babylon. And then Daniel was brought to Persia. And guess what? He's still over all these magi. What I'm trying to tell you is Daniel was a man of God. Daniel refused to bow. I'm sorry. Daniel refused not to bow and to pray to the Lord even after they made that decree. And what happened? He ended up in a lion's den. You think that the word of Daniel wasn't spreading around? You think people weren't taking notice? If people take notice of a simple little witness in South Louisiana, if they're living for the Lord, and people are like, oh man, I don't know, that dude's kind of maybe, maybe a little bit crazy, but he loves Jesus. Okay, if people are noticing these kinds of things, you think that that wasn't being told? Daniel, the one that's in charge, he's over all the wise men of Babylon. He refused not to bow. He refused to go according to the decree that we set him up for. And instead, he bowed to his God and he served his God. Now, I wanted you to, why would you discuss Daniel during the Christmas story? Because I want you to know where the wise men came from, the magi came from the east. I wanted to remind you that you serve the God that reveals secrets to men. And I want you to know that God has been announcing the truth that the Savior would be born for thousands of years. Now go to Numbers 24-17. Numbers 24-17 is a time frame after the Exodus. When the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness before he brought them into the promised land. Now, this is early on in the journey. Israel has already defeated Jericho and Ai, and the king of Moab has heard about them. The king of Moab, Balak, employs a false prophet named Balaam. Now, we don't have time to get into all the details. Well, why would God use a false prophet? God used a, a broken clock twice a day. I mean, right? God used a donkey to try to talk to that false prophet, Balaam, because he wouldn't listen to nobody. The point is, is that every time this false prophet tried to get God to curse the children of Israel, God said, I ain't cursing my own people. And in the end, what it, this is the prophecy that Balaam, the false prophet, spoke. I want you to see this. He says, I shall see him, but not now. Who's him? I'm, what I need you to understand is, when you read, I'm believing God that you're going to read the whole Bible this year. Amen? And when you read the whole Bible, let me just tell you this. What you need to understand is, God has always been wanting his people to know Messiah is coming. The children of Israel, the little bitty boys and girls, were being told God has chosen us as a nation to represent him. And unto us, he will give us a great king. Isaiah, our prophet, told us. 
He's going to be a great king that's going to come from the descendants of David, Isaiah told us. He's going to be a great king that's going to come from the tribe of Judah. Our great father Jacob told his son Judah whenever he blessed him in Genesis 49. Our God has been telling us that Messiah would come. So they knew. The whole nation of Israel was waiting for the arrival of Messiah. They didn't know he was going to be born in some little in some little bitty old town. They knew if they paid attention because Micah said it. But they didn't know he was going to come from some little poor carpenter family. They didn't know that he was going to be born. They, they didn't know he was going to be born in a manger. They didn't know he was going to show up on a donkey. No. They expected a king on a white stallion born in a palace to come in and to say, hey, Rome, no more. You set my people free. Right? They expected a king that was going to sit on a throne and give them freedom right here, right now. Right. Amen? I got to tell you something. That the Lord can give you and I freedom right here, right now. But that even still, the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan is not yet. It's not on this side of glory. Some of the things that we're seeking for, listen, for all I know, you might end up being a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, and a, a great for you if you know how to handle it. Right, but if you don't know how to handle it, curse to you. Mm -hmm. It's a curse to have money in your pocket and to not know what to do with it. Can I get an amen? Amen. You may be extremely blessed on this side of the world. And if you can handle it, praise God. But guess what? If you're trying to get all of your prizes and all of your gifts and all of your fulfillment on this side of glory, you're in for a long haul, my friend. Because some of that stuff's coming on the other side. Just like some of that was coming on the other side for Israel. Amen? All right. Let's keep reading. I shall see him who? Messiah. <laughs> but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. It means he's coming. There shall come a star. Look at that. One prophecy in the whole of the Old Testament that speaks right here that the prophet would say, there shall come a star out of Jacob. And a scepter, what is that? The king's staff shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy, destroy the children of Shem. Many of the early church fathers said, you know what? I believe, they, listen, and they listen, I've been believing this since before I even knew the church fathers said it. Arania said it, Origen said it, that they believed that the star the Magi saw was connected to the prophecy of Balaam, the false prophet of Isaiah. This obscure one prophetic message that speaks of a star rising that represents a king. Did you get that? It's, a, it's not just a star. It's a king's star. You see that? That word scepter right there is talking about the rule of a king. It's not just a star. It's not just any star. It's a king's star. And it came from a prophet Long before David was even born. So some people say, oh no, well, that's why we're talking about David. Maybe, but not the final fulfillment. David was just a type of the one that was to come. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. Okay, well that's good. So we got this. We got a prophecy recorded in biblical history that speaks of a king's star. But how these wise men knew that? Well, I'm here to tell you. I believe those wise men knew because of David. Can't prove it. But how else in the world did they know? Daniel, ruler, leader over the Magi, leader over the wise men in the same province that these Magi that came from the east came from and said in Matthew 2.1, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we are come to worship. My point this morning is that God wants people to know. Amen? He sent the angels to proclaim glory to the newborn king. God wanted people to know that he has good will towards them and that he sent the king of kings to die for their sin so that he could be born into their hearts. God wants to be born into our hearts. Amen? I believe that God sent a message thousands of years in advance through the prophecy of a false prophet about a king's star. That would one day come, and I believe that 1,000 years after that, God positioned Daniel in Babylon over the Magi. And Daniel, already knowing the prophecy of Balaam in his heart, would have informed the Magi of his time that he was coming. And that God, like he always does, 
protected his truth. Why? Because he is the God that reveals secrets to me. So the Magi over the next approximately 450 years knew what that star was when they found it. Where is he born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. If the musicians could come back up, we're going to go ahead and ask y'all to play. You can bring your communion with you. We're going to go ahead and ask y'all to play a song after we take communion together. But in closing, I just want you to know that he was born in the city of David. Like the angels sang, a little town called Bethlehem. <coughs> He was born in the city of David like the angels sang. It was a little town called Bethlehem like the prophet Michael foretold. You can find him there in Bethlehem. The town whose name means house of bread. You can find him there, wise man, and you can bring him your gifts and lay them at his feet. And there you can prostrate yourself and worship him. God promised bread from heaven. And he brought it down into the house of bread. Whenever we take communion, that's what we're remembering. God promised bread from heaven. He brought it down into the house of bread. You can't make this stuff up, my friend. It's been written thousands of years before he ever showed up. God promised peace on earth. The peace he offers was the death of his son as payment for the sin of man. The greatest gift of all. And the wise man or woman that humbles himself under this truth can and will find peace. Even in the midst of turmoil, can you see how God, how committed God is to revealing his kingdom through his word? Won't you let him be born into your heart today? Maybe you're watching there on video at some point in time, you'll watch. You'll watch this message. Maybe you say, I don't know that I was there when his love came. I don't know if I was there like those shepherds on that night that those angels sang. I don't know if I was there on that night or that day, like some of my friends that have told me in the past, or my friend or my mom told me about that, that he was born into their heart, but he can be born into your heart right now. Right now as you're watching this video, or, or right now, some of us, maybe we feel like we've lost our way, and we need, we need the light of that star of Jacob to lead and guide us in the right path. You can invite him in right now. Invite him in and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Have your way with me, O Lord. I want to be your servant. I want to follow after you. Fill me up. Let your spirit fill me up, O Lord God. Have your way. Have your way in my heart and in my life, O Lord. Forgive me of my sin, Lord God, and teach me your way. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that your love would show up on the inside of us. Lord, that you would reveal your hope and your love and your plan to us, O Lord. That you would overwhelm us with your goodness and bring deliverance, Lord. Bring deliverance, Lord God, in the midst of this journey. And I know that when you do, Lord God, that we will be overwhelmed with love for you. We will finally understand, Lord God, when you set us free, Lord, set us free, Lord. Until then, help us to believe, Lord God, that you have already set us free. Lord God, right now, and Father, we want to thank you for the bread of heaven that you gave us. For that bread that you brought down to the house of bread that night. Lord, right now, we ask that you would bless this bread. As we begin to take it together, that we would be reminded that this represents the sinless body of your son. That you sent into this world. That the heavens and the angels sang, peace, goodwill towards men. Father, bless this bread as we eat it together. This cup right here represents the cross. It represents the sacrifice. Sometimes people wonder why y'all get so caught up in the cross. It's not so much the pieces of wood. It's not the pieces of wood. That's just what God chose. That was the altar God chose. The, the instrument of death that God chose. It's the sacrament. The, the cup represents his blood that was poured out. The life of the creature is in the blood. He said this is the cup of the New Testament. It is my blood. The blood of the New Covenant it is given to Jesus shed his blood knowing that he was the sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When we drink this cup, we remember what he did for us. We remember that he died on the cross for our sin. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance until I return again. He's coming back again, church. 
He's coming back again for a bride without spot or blemish. Father, I ask that you would bless this cup, this cup that represents the cross of your son, the sacrifice of your son. Bless it as we drink it together. They're going to lead us in a worship song, and I just want to encourage you to close your eyes and to focus on your King. Invite Him into your heart. Ask Him to have His way. Let's worship the King together. Thank you. 